بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Okay, so today, inshallah, we're going to talk about uh, structuring machine learning projects. So so far, you have already learned how to uh, build a neural network and uh, uh, what is a neural network, what, how we can improve the performance of neural network, for example, using optimization algorithms, using hyperparameter tuning and also regularization. And now imagine that you come to a real project and you would like to contact uh, a deep learning project or so training and later on inference. So the objective of this course is to give you the guidelines and uh, different uh, recommendations in order to effectively conduct uh, your machine learning project. So inshallah, I'm going to start from uh, a real example. Okay, uh, let me start from the, uh, the example of uh, vehicle classification as uh, an illustration of uh, what we want to achieve. So here we have uh, different notebooks. Uh, I need to open them back from uh, my drive account. So I have already given to you these uh, notebooks for the classification project of uh, vehicle, vehicle type classification. And now let's start with uh, the following notebook here, this one. Okay, let me close. So here we have two notebooks, one for training and the, the second one for, uh, for evaluation. So I assume that you have already, you already have uh, an understanding about the content of the notebook. In, in, in the beginning here, uh, we're going to train in this uh, notebook and we will use uh, a mobile net uh, architecture. And here we will freeze all uh, the base model layers. So uh, here we're going only to train, we're going only to train the, uh, the head model, which we're going to add at the end. Which is, uh, what is the head model? Okay, it's this one. We're going to train only the head model and we are going to freeze all the first layers or the base model of uh, the mobile net. So imagine that we can do a training. Okay, let me execute this notebook over here. I need to open the drive. Okay, the authorization token for the Google Drive here. And the first thing we load the data set, which is the training. So using uh, this method, load data set from HDF file, it will load the training data and also the validation data. And the test data set, but we will not need the test data set over here. So the first thing that you need to do is to make the visualization and we will come back to it just in a while to see the importance of visualization. So we can visualize part of the train data set the validation data set and also the test data set. Then we're going to do data augmentation. And this is to have uh, uh, better uh, training performance. So the data augmentation here, we're going to make some random rotation with a maximum degree of, uh, uh, with a maximum rotation angle of 20 degrees. And then uh, we have two options, whether we train for the first time or we train uh, for the second or uh, not for the first time. So if we train for the first time, we're going to load the weights of uh, the image net. So here uh, we are using transfer learning. And instead of uh, starting from random weights, which, go, which is going to take uh, very long to convert, we're going to start from the image net uh, weights. And uh, this will help to have uh, faster conversions. And include top equal to false. It means that we will not uh, consider the, we will not train. Uh, so include top false yeah so here it it it, uh, it means that we are going to remove the head model uh, because you know that uh, in convolutional network we have part for feature extraction and the other part is for classification so we will remove the part for classification and we're going to redo the part of classification this is the things that we are going to train but these are like details we, we don't need them for now but just i'm explaining uh, i'm explaining the model itself doctor Yes. I have a question about the include top. Yes. So uh, it's true. Are we going to have a problem uh, with our data? Yeah. If you make include top, it means you're going to use the whole mobile net 
Yes. Uh, the whole mobile net. Yes, you can do that if you want. But uh, and it's not going to be like a big problem. Yeah. Usually in transfer learning, what we do, we freeze the feature extraction layers. Okay, and we train the classifier. So we'll train just the classifier uh, without yes. data, and we'll use yes. the uh... yes. Okay. Uh, so yes, I got... Yeah. Uh, I think it will make problem because there is different size, maybe or something like that. No, no. This is just a choice. You know, the other notebook that I have here, we train everything. Okay. So in transfer okay. learning, this is just to show you that we can freeze some layers and we can train some others. But basically, in this kind of situation, you can also train even the feature extraction layers as well. So we could include uh, top equals true and make it trainable. No, top equal true. No, uh, here, if you want to train everything, so in this case, uh, where, where, where do we define that it? it's here? Layer trainable equal to false. So here you can make it true if you want to train the base model as well. Okay, so now in, in our case, we're going to train only the head model, which is this one. But if you want to train also the whole thing, the feature extraction as well. So you don't do uh, base model layer equal to false. Trainable equal to false. Doctor? Yes. For that augmentation. Yes. Can you do? I have a question, Yanni. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when you uh, said here the rotation range equal uh, 20, this means for all image, it will be do with that augmentation 20 no. times? No. In every epoch, it will make random orientation of a maximum degree of 20, uh, maximum angle of 20 degrees. This is what it will do. Okay. Uh -huh. so, right and left, right, doctor? Yes, right and left, yes, yes. It's right and left. But anyway, these are just configuration. Now, now what we would like to, to focus is uh, when after we do the training, like here. So, of course, you train your model. Uh, you will train your model with certain parameters, like, for example, you specify the learning rate, the initial epoch, uh, and uh, how many epochs you want to train, uh, the batch size. Uh, you fix also the optimizer. Here we use Adam optimizer. We have introduced this in the, in the previous week. You compile your model and you provide the loss function. Okay, uh, and here you pass in the optimizer and the metric that you want you'd like to, to monitor. And basically here you start the training. Okay, so model that fit, it will start the training. And for example, in this case, we are going to train for uh, 100 epoch. And we can see here the train accuracy and the validation accuracy. Okay, maybe I can do a training from scratch, but uh, I need to remove a few things like uh, the log file. Let me check because otherwise it will just append on the previous log file. So let me change its name here. Or uh, I can change the iteration. So here I put the notebook very configurable. So we can specify yes. the iteration number three. So just to avoid even if we can change, for example, the model. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, um, now my purpose today, uh, we're, we're going to ch uh, change the models next week. But today we're going to focus on the training performance. So now we have okay. the, the whole notebook is there and we will perform the training. So I think it will take uh, around 10 minutes. But that's okay. okay. Yes. Uh, I tried uh, to include top equals true to see what happens. And uh, it gave me an error for the pool size. So I need I changed it to two and two and it worked. But why? Well, what did you try to change? The uh, include the top model, the classification model uh, to true, and yeah, uh, yeah and then uh, I run the cell after it, which is constructing. Uh, yeah, it will give you it will give you maybe uh, wrong because uh, the number of classes might be different from your number of classes. The it gave me doctor error for the pool size. So when I change it to two and two, it, uh, it was uh, it worked. Which pool size? The average pooling 2D yeah. pool size. No, if you put true here, you should not do the following. I shouldn't do it because it's already there. Yes, okay. because it's already there. Otherwise, you're going to make duplicate uh, classification. And it, it doesn't make sense. Basically, in transfer learning, we have to remove, at least you have to remove the last layer. The last layer because the last layer contains the number of classes. Okay, so you must make sure that the last layer contains the correct number of classes of your uh, okay of your data set. Uh, doctor? Yes. 
I have a question. Uh, now for uh, this uh, uh, network, okay, when you collect the image and you do the crop for the image, you mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. okay, and you divide it to training and test it, mm-hmm. and you convert it to a five. Uh, okay, if I'm uh, using the labeling box, uh, it will be the same or it will be different, Yani. No, the label box is a tool in order to label the images. Okay, it, 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 you will label the images, so you will make bounding boxes. This is for object detection mainly. This oh, project okay. is for object classification. There is a difference. Okay? okay, what you do in label box is for object detection, and it's completely different. And uh, next week or the week after, we are going to introduce how to manage this. But for, this okay. is for object classification usually, and we explain this in the beginning, or you can see this back in the course. You're going to create a data set, okay, and you put your images. Uh, maybe I don't have here the data set, but you need to create folders and every folder name should contain, okay, should be the class name. And inside every folder, you put the images of that particular class. This is how we do in uh, in uh, object classification. Clear. And uh, Dr. I have a, a question. What's the best uh, size for the image on the neural network? The best size for the image? Yes. No, this is a hyperparameter. Okay, this is one of the things that you can change. I'm going to talk about this today. Okay, uh, now it depends on the performance. So now I'm just doing one uh, one training, and based on this, we are going to discuss what we should do. So we can see now when we start the training, we start from a very low uh, training accuracy and also low validation accuracy, and then it will start improving for both the training and the validation. So here you can see initially the validation looks a little bit better. But uh, with uh, with training more, okay. In principle, here we should have uh, higher. So here, surprisingly, the validation accuracy is higher than the training accuracy, which is unusual. But we have to wait until the end of the training. So here, okay. Now it's ninety percent, but still the validation accuracy is lower. This is why we need to train for a large number of epochs. Okay. Look here, there are up and downs. So I'm going to, we can just wait a little bit until the training will finish and then we will try to analyze it. Because it is important when you conduct a deep learning project, you must un, you must be able to analyze the performance of your data to know what you have to do next. Okay, and for this there are different type of strategies. So maybe I can switch to the slides while the training is being done. Okay, so imagine that you do like a deep learning project, for example, let's say for cat, not cat classification and uh, you don't find like uh, that you have uh, good performance. So in this case, you will find yourself in front of multiple strategies. There are multiple ideas that you can do in order to uh, improve your training performance. So maybe you can say, I, I would like to collect more data. Maybe you don't have enough data. So one of the ideas is to collect more data and then train again. Or maybe you can also collect a diverse training data set. Uh, maybe the data is just tied to a particular distribution and you need to make different type of distributions. Or maybe you need to train your algorithm a little bit longer uh, with uh, some uh, with gradient descent. Okay, all of these are techniques that probably it would lead to improving your solution. You can try also different types of uh, optimizers. Okay, uh, you can use Adam optimizer or Hermes prop or uh, maybe uh, uh, momentum. Okay, uh, moving weighted average. So there are plenty of choices that you can do. You can try a bigger network or a smaller network, depending if you have overfitting or underfitting. You can try different types of regularization technique, L2 or dropout. You can maybe add batch normalization or remove batch normalization, change the whole network architecture, uh, change the activation function, increase the number of hidden units. There are plenty of things that you may try to do. So in this lecture, we will try to guide you, give you some systematic approach on how you can analyze your uh, trained model and based on the observation how you, uh, what are the priorities that you have to start with okay you should not just do randomly okay let me just add a dropout or remove regularization or add data or so on okay in some cases maybe you're going to spend much more time in trying to find more data and at the end it will not improve the performance of your uh, your uh, training algorithm so in this case you will have to, you will just uh, lose time in trying to make data augmentation or adding more data but this will not be uh, very helpful in your training so you must be able to analyze uh, the outcome of uh, of the training performance to be able to uh, uh, to know what you have to do next in order to improve it 
Okay, so basically the, the strategy here is basically tuning. Okay, we're going to tune different type of parameters. But the problem is what type of parameters we, we have to tune. Okay, because we have so many hyperparameters. Okay, this is similar to, for example, when you want to adjust uh, the uh, image quality in uh, television or on a computer screen. Uh, you may want to adjust the height of the image, the width of the image, okay, the, uh, maybe the brightness, the contrast. So you will do a lot of adjustment until you are satisfied with the quality. Okay, so you can think about all these different buttons like the, your hyperparameters. And, and whenever you tune anything, it will have an impact on the overall uh, quality okay, of the image here in this example. And you will keep tuning all of them in different manners or in different ways until you are satisfied. But of course, the relation with the planning project is that you must know what kind of button you have to tune. You should not do just this randomly because it might not lead you to uh, an effective approach in order to converge to the solution that you want. Okay, so what we can summarize like uh, in the following slide like the chain of assumptions that you can do in when conducting machine learning projects. Uh, okay, so first of all, you will check uh, the fit of your training set on the cost function, whether the training data set gives you a good performance in itself. Okay, this is the first thing that you will have to look at, is the training uh, accuracy is good enough. It means whether the data set that they have provided to optimize the cost function was sufficient to achieve this objective. Okay, if it is sufficient, that's fine. You can go to the next level of observation. And if it's not, okay, in this case, there are some possible strategies. Maybe you need to try a bigger network uh, or maybe a smaller network if you have also overfitting. Uh, maybe you can try uh, some uh, techniques for optimization, like for example, using Adam Optimizer or changing the optimizer itself. So whenever the, uh, the training performance is not good, uh, you might try to think about changing the network itself, okay, or trying to do some kind of additional optimization uh, in order to check whether you can reach the performance that you want. And now if the training performance is good, in this case, you're going to look at the performance on the validation data set. Okay, this is the second step. So the first thing we need to look at the training performance and then the validation performance. And here, we will see whether, for example, maybe the validation performance is much lower than the training performance. In this case, you know that we have overfitting. So we can try regularization. Okay, so maybe regularization is not uh, appropriate here when just looking only at the training performance because, uh, because still we're not able even to optimize the network with respect to the training data set. But if the problem is the validation data set, so regularization is one, is the first thing that we can think about it. Okay, in order to reduce the gap between the training performance, which was good, and the validation performance, which was not good enough. We can uh, make uh, bigger training networks or uh, increasing the data set. We can make data augmentation, okay, uh, when we have uh, poor validation performance. Now, if the validation performance and the training performance are both correct and fine and good enough, we're going to look at the performance on the testing data set, which is a data set not that has not been used uh, during the training, not even for validating the, the performance. And okay, again, this is similar to if we have a low validation uh, performance, maybe you need to increase your, uh, your data set, adding more images, trying regularization as well, and trying different type of uh, techniques to, uh, to improve. So basically, if I find that the test is not good, uh, the first thing I, I might try to do is to add more images try to add more images from the same context of the test data set. Maybe you have this much distribution. Uh, maybe you don't have enough images that are representative of uh, your uh, deployment scenario. So in this case, you have to look at the, uh, the images themselves. You can also try to have different types of data augmentation. For example, now in our case, we have included the rotation of 20 degrees uh, just to provide more reliable uh, training performance and even uh, validation performance. And the last step, okay, now if everything works fine on the train data set, the dev data set, and the test data set, we're going now to deploy our model in real world. And uh, luckily, the model is going to work fine. But otherwise, if it doesn't work fine in real world, also it worked fine on the test and the validation data set. In this case, we may try to change the cost function. So maybe there is an issue with the cost function. We, uh, it cannot be like uh, generalized. We can try to 
even make for example cross validation uh, try to train on different networks until we get satisfactory results so this is just a summary about uh, the main things that uh, you may want to try when uh, you have uh, any issue in uh, in the training performance okay now we can see we, uh, the training has ended here so let's try to make a, a practice on this example okay I'm, what i'm going to do now i'm going to look at the, how uh, the validation and so the first thing the training accuracy and the validation accuracy so in this case they are almost close to each other okay so how do you analyze now what do you observe guys okay this is the plot i can show you the plot here both validation and uh, training are very close together yeah they are, they are close to each other so here we can observe something really weird maybe it doesn't happen too much is that the train loss is higher than the validation loss and we can see this here look this is the validation loss and the, this is the train loss okay so now if you have uh, and even here we, we have the validation accuracy is even higher than the train accuracy this is interesting case okay now guys now if you have this what what thing are you going to do saying the uh, training data I think here uh, if there is a very very different between doctor validation and testing and validation is more yeah now we are like in this case okay I think we, we are, can increase we are in this case now doctor add more yes. make bigger network more layer yeah so one of the things we can do maybe we can train for more time okay uh, we can see that the training accuracy started to improve uh, until some point but then uh, maybe we didn't give enough time here okay now even be, uh, i don't think that we we should go for adding more images because we don't have really overfitting okay uh, we have maybe underfitting here uh, so one of the things we can do here maybe we can change the batch size or maybe try to train just for longer period of time okay now in this particular case i will try to train for uh, a little bit longer uh, doctor yes and we have also another pro we have another problem that may lead to this is that we have freezed the base model because the base model was trained on imagenet and it was not trained on this particular data set only the classifier was trained so now what we can do we can try to do the same network and the same settings with making the base layer model as uh, trainable and this is actually this this notebook we can try it now and try to run the same experiment on uh, the other notebook uh, in the same way as already mentioned we can also train for a longer time we can train for a longer time but i guess here that the main problem is coming from the fact that we did not train the base uh, the base model okay so let's make the experiment let's make the experiment here we're going to have uh, exactly the same setting the only difference is that we're going to make the base model as trainable okay so here i'm oh, going to make it true and we can see okay. yeah we can see that here uh, in the summary uh, where is the summary model dot summary here this is the number of trainable parameters we will have two million trainable parameters and here you will have uh, only uh, one, uh, 173,000 uh, trainable parameters because uh, of course here we have more trainable parameters because here we train everything and here we have freezed uh, everything except the head model okay and let's see the impact here. yes yes there is a huge difference yes now it seems that uh, just freezing the the base model was not effective okay in terms of uh, the training accuracy because uh, the, maybe the, the image net is not very representative of uh, of our new uh, data uh, of our new data set so in this case i'm going to uh, terminate uh, on the other notebook and now i'm going to run over here so it will allocate the resources and uh, we may leave it for some time so here we have exactly the same uh, the same strategy so let me check the google drive i want to enable it 
دكتور يو سيد بيس بيس لير يس وات دو يو مين ذا لير بيفور ذا اوت بوت اور ذا لير تو انبوت Uh, this is something that I have explained in, uh, in the Udemy course. Let me let me open the. I don't know. Okay, let me check the slides. I will try to bring the slides for the Udemy course. You have seen the Udemy course, Toto? All the Udemy yes. course? Yes. 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 So, okay, just let me go to my ADB courses here and deep learning in practice slides. So, if you remember, I told you that the typical CNN, it has the following architecture. Okay, we have uh, the feature extraction layer. This is actually a convolution neural network, which will be the topic next week. We will talk about how, what does it mean convolution and how the image is processed in a convolutional layer. And then here we have the classification model and the classification model is a fully connected fully connected layers okay so what we did so far okay in our strategy and this is actually the same we have freezed we have made uh, we have freezed the uh, where, where did I? Yeah, this is the first approach. So the first approach, what we will do, we will make this layer the trainable equal to false. Okay, so all these layers will not be trainable. And this is what we did in the beginning. Okay. So, and we will make the head model, which is actually the fully connected network as trainable. Of course, in this case, uh, the training will be much faster because all these layers will not be trained. But you have seen that it didn't lead to uh, very high training performance. So this is why we can do the second training approach where we put the base model, everything to trainable. Okay, and also we will train the head model, which is the fully connected layer. Is this clear? Yes, doctor. Okay. So this is what we, what we have done. Okay, uh, and this is one of the things that you can try Okay, when you do, for example, a transfer learning project, uh, import date time. Okay, yes. Date time, that date time, that now. I think there's a missing E, doctor, after yeah. No, the T is missing. Yeah, the T now is missing. After the date I. Okay. Okay, let me just calculate the time now. In the previous example, it spent uh, like uh, 10 seconds, uh, 10 minutes to train. Okay, and here we can make a uh, training time. And here we can make T1 minus T0. And let's keep it training. I think it will take maybe, maybe 15 minutes because now we have more, uh, more layers to train. But later on, we are going to compare between uh, the training performance here and also the training performance here. Okay. Okay, is this strategy clear now? Okay, we're going to now to apply it on this model. But overall, this is how uh, you can structure the uh, okay the observations of a machine learning model in general and this doesn't apply only to deep learning i mean this applies to machine learning because in every machine learning project you always have a trained data set a validation data set and a test data set so uh, even if you use different type of techniques okay it's the same principle okay now another thing is uh, what kind of evaluation metrics and after you complete the training of your uh, uh, deep learning project you will think about, okay, I need to evaluate the performance of the model. And for this, we have different types of uh, evaluation metrics. And basically, the first thing that we look at is uh, how many true positives and true negatives, false positives and false negative are uh, the model has led to. So how do we do that? So basically, let's say that uh, we do cat, not cat classifier. 
So let's say a cat is a positive case and a not cat is a negative. And we are going to uh, take, for example, the validation data set or the test data set. And we will see how many predicted positives, how many images were uh, that are cat were predicted as cat. And we will call this as a true positives because they are cat and they were predicted as cats. Okay. And we will check also the number of predicted negative. So what does it mean? Uh, it means it is not cut, but it was predicted as uh, false false negative. So here, false negative, it means it was predicted as cut and it is not cut. So uh, in the same way, for the class that is not cut, we're going to look at the number of false positives. So for example, this is a cat, but it was predicted as, uh, this is a dog, it was predicted as cat. Okay. So this is called false positive and the true negative uh, it is actually not not cut and was predicted as not cut so we can make a table like this and here we will have the number of true positives the number of false negatives the number of false positives and the number of true negatives and based on this we can have different types of evaluation metrics we can calculate the precision okay so tp is true positive uh, fp is false positive, Fn is false negative, and Fp, uh, Tn is true negative. And based on these values here, we can calculate the precision, the recall, the F1 score, the accuracy, and the specificity. Okay, so uh, the precision here is calculated as true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. The recall is calculated as true positive divided by true positive and false negative uh, the f1 score is calculated by two uh, precision multiplied by recall divided by precision plus recall and the accuracy is calculated as uh, tp plus tn true positive plus true negative divided on the total okay and you can understand here the the, the accuracy it means how many correct predictions over the total number of predictions Okay, so it's simple to understand the meaning of the accuracy. It's how many... Ma yes. I'm sorry. Uh, continue. Just have a question at the end. Okay, so the accuracy here, it means how many correct predictions, TP plus TM, with respect to the total number of predictions made. This is the accuracy. Okay, so for the precision here, we are going to look at the total number of true positive and false positive. Okay, and we, we, will, we will calculate the ratio of positive here. Okay, among everything that was predicted as positive, what was, how many was correct? Okay, so you need to understand the meaning of every metric. Every metric has a particular meaning. Okay, so here among all the positive predictions, all the predictions that were predicted as positive, how many are true? For example, imagine that you have find, uh, let's say, 20 true positives and 10 false positive. We will make an example later. So here the precision will be 20 divided by 20 plus 10, 20 divided by 30. Okay, so here uh, 2 divided by 3 uh, is around uh, how much? 22 divided by 0 0.66. Okay, so 66% we can say of precision. Okay, and so on. So for the recall here, uh, we take the true positive and false negative true positive and false negative and uh, here we calculate uh, tp divided by this true positive and false negative here and the specificity here we take the true negative and you divide by true negative and false positive here. so it turns out that the f1 score is actually uh, the best metric that will capture between precision and recall so this is why in classification project basically the scientists they rely more on the F1 score rather than on the accuracy, the precision, or the recall because the F1 score, it takes into account both the precision and the recall. So let's make uh, an example. No. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I had a question about uh, the previous uh, slide. Okay. So what do we mean by recall and specificity? Not mathematically, but uh, in uh, natural language. Yeah, in natural language here, you, uh, you, will, uh, you will calculate the ratio of the positive prediction on the total of the positive and uh, uh, negative, is it Fn, 
it's a negative prediction of the positive cases here. Okay. I mean, so, why is it called recall? Yeah, it's I borrow the name "tazakkur." Recall means tazakkur. Okay, it recalls something. Translate it "tazakkur." And the specificity, specificity. Sorry. Yeah, here it's the it's applied to the true negative instead of the true positive. Okay, it is it is applied. It's the same for the recall, but for the negative cases. T n plus f p. And the recall, even in some cases, it's called sensitivity. So we can find in the literature that it may also be called sensitivity. Like in my bar, like can the model is able to remember the positive values. For example, now, for example, we will make an example here. Okay, let's make an example. We have uh, the following. Uh, this is called, like by the way, confusion matrix. Okay, this is called a confusion matrix. You have cat is detected five times as cat. And uh, the cat is detected two times as dog, and the dog is detected three times as cat and three times as dog. So here we can calculate the precision, which is the first one. TP divided by TP plus FP. So we have seventy-one percent of precision. So the recall, the recall will be here, five divided by five plus three, TP plus false negative three here. Okay, so it it means that it is able to recall sixty two percent the cat class. Sixty two percent of cats. Uh, yes, right? it is able to recall the class cat with with a, an, uh, with sixty two percent. I mean, uh, yes, of performance. Okay, this is for the recall, and this makes sense because look among the uh, uh, okay uh, among three instances of dog, it thinks that it is a cat. So it was not able to recall it correctly for the three instances of the dog. Okay, so when the number of uh, false negative increase, this will affect the recall performance. Uh, doctor, how do we know the number of dogs and the number of cats? This is in the data set you have. You have in the data set. Uh, for example, well, so the number of dogs and the number of cats. Yeah. So here you have the number of dogs. Yes, you have five plus three is the number of cats, and three plus two is the number of dogs. Okay. You have the actual here. This is the actual class. Look, three plus two, five plus three. You can look at the actual class and you can make the count. Okay, so uh, in this slide, I illustrate why the F score. Could be a better uh, approach in order to evaluate the uh, performance of machine learning model. So imagine that you have a classifier that will give you, for example, 95% of precision and 90% of recall, and another classifier will give you 98% of precision but lower recall values, 85% of recall. So how can we compare between these two classifiers? Here, one is giving a better precision value, and the other one is giving A better recall value. So the best way here is to to look at the combination of precision and recall. So remember that F1 it combines both the precision and recall. So in this case, what we can do, we can ca calculate the F1 score by applying the formula here, and you can find that classifier A it gives 92.4 percent of score, and classifier B it gives 91.0 percent for F1 score. So maybe here we can decide that the classifier A is better in terms of performance in average. Because it provides a better trade-off between the precision and also the recall. Okay, so same thing. If you have multiple classifiers and they give different type of uh, performance, for example, here we have classifier A, classifier B. Uh, it gives every classifier would give you like a different uh, uh, percentage error on a particular class. So the rule of thumb is that we do we try to calculate the average. Okay, for example, classifier A, uh, it gives us the following percentage error. The classifier B gives the following percentage error. Uh, for example, classifier C, it provides uh, here a different percentage error. It's lower, uh, so here it's clearly it's lower for everything. So the best way to compare between the performance of these different algorithms is to calculate the average error of everyone. 
for example here a give you six percent here 6.5 3.5 and then you can choose the minimum one okay so you can you can actually uh, uh, rank them or sort them based on the average accuracy uh, over all different classes okay now for example uh, if we can see here this classifier it gives like a lower error than classifier c okay on the class other uh, it gives also lower uh, lower value on india okay but in average classifier c is better okay because also we have here uh, different performance for china and for the us so basically it's better that you uh, make an aggregation of all the different accuracies and based on the average you can compare between the performance of, of the classifiers okay another thing that is uh, also important to evaluate the performance of uh, deep learning models is uh, the confusion matrix we have shown the confusion matrix for only two classes but it can also be calculated for multiple classes uh, this is an example of the fashion amnist uh, data set that you can find on the tensorflow documentation and tutorials and basically in the confusion matrix we're going to provide in diagonal all the true positive okay so here for example we have t-shirt top which is the first class was detected 81 times correctly and uh, was detected here uh, two times as trouser was detected two times as pullover and was detected 14 times as shirt so we can see that maybe here there is a confusion there is a high confusion between the shirt class and the t-shirt class and this could make sense because maybe t-shirt sometimes it's really difficult to differentiate between the shirt itself okay so the confusion matrix it allows you it's a heat map and you can see that you have a coloring scale that will tell you the correlation okay or how, how strong the uh, uh, the prediction value here so when it is uh, dark it means that it's uh, it's high value okay high percentage so we can identify so of course the diagonal should be the highest but you can identify the high values by their colors here here we have for example 17 errors it's between the coat and the pullover so this will either help you to to know what is the strategy so maybe you need to work more on the coat and pullover because of uh, these misclassifications now for example if you look at uh, let's say to the ankle boot down here so 96 were correctly classified so this means it has high accuracy okay only four was were misclassified okay and all of them were just confused to sneakers so this kind of table it allows you on what is the strategy in order to fix the problems okay maybe for example you, you need to provide more uh, uh, more labors for the coat so in order that it will not confuse it with the pullover okay and here even the pullover it it works fine i mean it's not even too much confused with the coat only seven times but the coat was too much confused for with the, with the pullover here and it, you can also identify what are the classes that worked safely for example trouser here it's 98 percent were correctly classified so maybe i should not too much bother myself about the trouser class because the trouser class did get actually good performance okay so this is how we can analyze the performance of uh, the deep learning model using these different type of techniques so now we can yes can you go the brief yes this slide yes can you repeat how to solve this problem if which you for example which problem for the t-shirt when you uh, it's predicted wrong for uh, 14 yes like we had shirt is confused 14 times with the shirt here so maybe in this case you have to focus more on the class t-shirt and you try to provide more training examples okay so to reduce to reduce the confusion to reduce the error of prediction is that another way or just uh, this way what is the other way no i ask there are another way to yeah basically i mean if the, now if we find that some particular classes they have issues it means that we need to make something in the data set of these classes maybe maybe you can have mislabeled for example one of the problems that you can have is maybe you have mislabeled data set maybe for example the t-shirt was mislabeled in, with the shirt so i have to look 
okay or if you find that everything was correctly labeled maybe you don't have training examples there are many reasons okay that could lead to, to the following situation okay so, so, so yeah so if you remember when we did the car classification data set uh, if you remember uh, we were analyzing the classes for which we didn't have good performance do you remember this okay and for yes. these classes what we decided to do we decided to increase the, the data first of all we check whether there is mislabel mislabeling and if there is no mislabeling in this case we can try to make data augmentation for that particular class we also checked for like bad quality images doctor yes maybe it's related to the distribution of images maybe it's related to the quality of images to their size okay so when you see the values like this this means this is an indicator that you have to look at that particular class okay you have to look at them first of all check whether you have mislabeling check that whether you have a problem in the data distribution uh, or problem in uh, the data size data quality and try to fix accordingly uh, doctor yes so just as a refresher the blue bars uh, represent uh, the confidence level for each class yes yes okay doctor yes uh, and in like the shirt class here, uh, it's confusing it with uh, pullovers and t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Should we check uh, shirt, uh, pullover and t-shirt? Because maybe even t-shirt has like some uh, examples close or really close or even have a t-shirt in the data. Which value? Here? Which value? Like shirt, the shirt class. Oh, okay, the shirt class here, yes. Yes, confusing with pullover and t-shirt. So we should check for, uh, for the yes. shirt class. Yes. And t-shirt also and the pullover? Yes, I will check first of all whether, for example, the, the shirt was misclassified with these two. Okay. And if not, maybe we can add more training examples. Like it is clear that the shirt here is suffering somehow. Okay. It's suffering. So there is something wrong in the data set. Because now I cannot blame too much the, uh, the deep learning model itself because we have some classes that have excellent performance. But some other classes they have weak performance so in this case i have to look at these classes and check their data whether there is an issue with them or in some, the yeah and, and in some cases maybe it, there is not even to bother too much for example if it is really difficult that a human distinguish between t-shirt and shirt so we can tolerate this okay we can tolerate this and and we did this for example in the car classification uh, example uh, sometimes there is a confusion maybe in two generations of a model so this can be understood oh, for example if you take victoria crown and uh, mercury so if the model confuses between both of them so this is not a big deal because even for human eye it can even be confusing for, uh, at human level do you understand what i mean yes yes there are yes. like some examples that even yeah. humans can yes and, and yeah, yeah just a moment and in some cases you know maybe if this is possible we can try even to merge the classes that might be confusing uh, if there is no sufficient features to distinguish between them. For example, if we realize that T-shirt and shirt is really difficult to distinguish between them with the human eye level, maybe we can decide to merge them into one class so we have more robust classification. That's, that's one possible way. So there are different ways on how you can overcome these kind of situations. And doctor, could, we, could the problem be uh... In this example like the shirt example could the t-shirt have something to do with it the data in the t-shirt like in the other class that the shirt is confusing it with yeah it's possible uh, this is possible i mean now i'm going to show you some examples you have to analyze your data okay you have to analyze your data and check what particular data is making problem and based on this you can plan a strategy in order to fix your data if it comes if the problem from comes from the data set itself in this case, you have to plan a strategy in order to improve it. Or maybe just doing some kind of uh, data augmentation will be sufficient. Or you need to bring additional data to your data set. Or maybe you need, to look at the, you need to look at the distribution of your data. There are many things that you can try to do in order to overcome this problem. Doctor? Yes. Uh, if there is confusion between two classes or more, and we need to add uh, more data, to which uh, class we add all of them or uh, one of them or what? No, you don't need to add to all of them. 
uh, for example here adding more data to the trouser maybe it's not needed because the trouser has already uh, 98 performance 98 uh, 98 of confidence here so the trouser is not suffering you just need to add to the data that you think that it is suffering from low performance like for example here the shirt has only 62 percent uh, the coat has 77 percent so basically these two classes are the main problem here okay i need to do something for these two classes and then you have to look at maybe 86 percent 81 percent try to fix them but of course the priority here would be for the shirt i need to do something here it's really very low okay and then you do some other iterations and try to improve from one iteration to the other if for example you just add data and you didn't change too much we have already seen what to do maybe you can try different network Maybe you can try different type of uh, optimization techniques, change the optimizer, change the loss function, okay, until you get the uh, performance that you need. Okay. Is it clear? Yes. Yeah, and now we can try to apply this uh, on our model here. Okay, so let me connect. Let me check how things were working on the notebook. Wow, very nice. Ah, you know, we did an error, I think. I think I didn't start. It has started from... Uh, yeah, I didn't remove the log file. I, have, I should have changed the iteration. Okay, I should have changed the iteration. But let's see. Yeah. We can see that here we have reached 100% for both the training and the validation. So what is better here? When we made it all trainable. Yes, when we make it all trainable, we got something really satisfactory. So now we can say we are happy with both the validation and we are happy with also the training accuracy. Okay, so what is the next step? Uh, we'll do the test. Yeah, we will do the yes, testing. Yes, we start the testing. Yes, now, and this is why we make a testing data set, which is independent. Look now here in the training, I didn't do anything related to the testing. Everything was just validated with the validation data set. Okay, that is fine, but I don't know whether now if I take this model and put it working in the real world, whether it's going to perform well or not. So I need to do additional testing on other set of data that is not included in the training okay so and this is why here we have another uh, evaluation uh, notebook so we have the evaluation notebook which i can open and this will help us to evaluate the model more thoroughly okay i need to disconnect this one Uh, which iteration I have trained here. Okay, I need to check the iteration number. Oh, one, two. Okay, so this is the model now. Okay. I have found this model. This is the iteration one, two. It will be evaluate. Okay, I will open the token here. And basically these notebooks that I have provided to you here, you can use them in any classification project. All you need to do is just changing the path to your data set, these paths here. Everything else will remain the same. Okay, and of course you have to specify your number of iteration, your username, so it was really made to be fully customized to uh, any new training. Okay, so let me start again from this iteration number, then the drive, and then we're going to include the library. So we will load the, only here we need to load the dev, the validation and the test data set. So I made the function for this, just to avoid loading the train data set and putting it into the memory, I don't really need it. 
uh, here you have to verify your shapes so I have 75 images in the validation and the validation I already here have an idea about its performance okay but uh, what is new here is the test data set it has uh, 76 images which I will use for the evaluation of the model okay now we make a visualization of the data and the visualization of data is important because it allow you to see whether you have misclassification or not okay so you can uh, you can visualize sample data so for example if I want to add two rows here to visualize more images and the good practice is just to check so here it's car SUV all types it's correct this is motorcycle motorbike chopper it's correct uh, car bus uh, all types it's correct so it's good that you make sure that the labels are correct corresponds correctly to the images and this is a step that you do to, uh, to make sure that you don't have mis uh, mislabeling of course sometimes it's not possible uh, it's not possible to uh, visualize the whole data set this is why you can make like a, a random sample uh, I, I think here it doesn't make it randomly but we can actually make it to every time loaded it will provide us uh, a different sample to visualize and now it's the time for the evaluation so in the evaluation what we will do we will load the model so the model this is the model that we have saved in the checkpoint which is this model okay and then we will apply this model we will predict it we will make the evaluation both on the validation and on the test so on the validation data set let's see how much it will give so it takes time because it will evaluate 75 images all of them will be predicted and maybe also we can try to to calculate the prediction time for all these images so it of course as we expect it has given to us uh, uh, an evaluation of uh, uh, an evaluation of 100 uh, percent so I will do the same now but now I will do it on the test data set so now it is the time to do it on the test data set and let's see how much is the evaluation okay I didn't print the value of uh, test X uh, okay uh, result and then I will print the result okay I will do the same here for the test data set and then I will print it so basically it's fast the evaluation is fast and here we can find that we have 98% on the validation which is smaller okay the difference is not uh, too much uh, I can see that also this is the loss is 0.2 so the loss on the test data set is higher and the accuracy is a little bit lower okay so this is a first thing uh, a first observation uh, whether I am satisfied with the validation uh, or, or with the test that, uh, with the test accuracy or not uh, I think 98% uh, dot 6 should be fine and maybe we can also try it on uh, the other uh, the other model but let's first uh, continue the other parts okay uh, another thing that you can do also testing on one image okay you can test on one image to check whether uh, whether everything is fine you can also test on the whole data set and this is now the confusion matrix okay the confusion matrix on the test data set so let's see in more details now of course now I know that I have found 98% of accuracy but now what is the accuracy at the class level and this is can be done through the confusion matrix now I can see that the car the buses are all correctly detected we have one precision one recall and one F score okay the sedan is the same the SUV is the same the problem was with the bicycle 
Okay, so the bicycle, it has a precision of 93% of, uh, and the recall with uh, 100%, and an F-score with uh, 96%. And it was confused, maybe, with the motorcycle bicycle. So, but I, I can know this from the confusion matrix. The, these are now the, the precision, the recall, and the F-score for all the different classes, and they can see in more details where, is the, where the confusion is happening. So I can see that for the bus, it has 13 prediction correct, 12 prediction correct for the sedan, for the SUV, 9 prediction that are correct. For the uh, bicycle, so why, uh, why I don't have any wrong prediction here? It's strange. Yeah, yes. no, here we have 9 one. Here we have 9 one. Okay, but 13. Yeah, this is not clear. Predicted all labels, so here. Doctor, I think precision is uh, when an other uh, class uh, thinks that it's a uh, bicycle kit, so it's not misclassified. That's what you said in the uh, no, deep learning so, course. Yeah, yeah. Here we have thirteen instances, but all of them are correct. How it didn't make it? Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah, so this one is actually making the difference on both. Okay. Doctor. Yes. This mean for this nine and one, there is one uh, image that classified as other type. So should be 13, should be... Uh, yeah, in principle, yeah, in principle here we, uh, we should have at least for this, we should have some misclassification. It may, it does not 13, maybe it, it is 12, but 13, they give up, uh, they make you know, more one for it. No, no, let's try to calculate it manually. No problem, we can try to calculate it manually. So what is, what is the, uh, so this is the precision, right? Okay, for the, uh, yeah. for the motor bicycle, motorcycle bicycle here. So uh, this should be 13. Uh, what is the what is the equation? Let's remember the equation here of the precision and recall. It's this one. Okay. So we want to calculate the precision, which is true positive divided by true positive and false positive. So this is one is false positive. So divided by 14. And this is the 93%. Yeah, so it's it's, it's correct. It's correct. The other classes that yes. Uh, yes. And this one, this yeah, class. yeah, and this one, which has 10 here. Okay, uh, because this one was confused. So this means that there is one bicycle racing that was confused with bicycle kit. Only one instance. Okay, and this is how this instance has affected the model performance. Now, if we want to calculate here the recall for this one, what is the recall? It's TP, true positive, 9, divided by 10. Uh, divided by 10, and it's 90%. So, in fact, here we have only one misclassification. Only one. Doctor, sorry, for 13. Yes. What do, what do you do, Doctor? You make 13 divided by 14? Yes. Uh, why you, you add 1 to 13? Uh, this is one. Yeah, is yeah I, I'm calculating the precision. Look at the precision. It's TP it's divided by TP plus FP. So FP is 1, false positive. Ah, the one that's okay. Yes, okay. And this gives 13 divided by 14. It gives 93%. Now, if we want to calculate, so we calculate the recall, it will be 10 divided, uh, 9 divided by 10. Because here we have 9 divided by 9 plus 1. So 90%. Okay, so look, only one misclassification, it has contributed to the following. Because here, why maybe you say, you say 93% is too much? It's because maybe the number of images per uh, class is, is small. And this is why we need also to have a large uh, a large uh, test data set 
we have to, uh, we must have large number of images in every class in the test data set because now we are making our computation only out of 10 images yani if you miss one you will lose 10 percent okay so in order that the accuracy will be better if we have for example 100 images per per class in the test so in this case if you lose one it will contribute only to one percent you see the difference yes you can okay. judge even more yes. uh, better yes exactly so there is a trade-off because now okay if you say okay let me increase the test data set that's possible but you are going to have less images for the training and if you put more images for the training later on in your uh, evaluation you will have smaller amount of data to make the testing so you will not have sufficient data for extracting the right precision and recalls okay so this is why uh, the selection of the data set size is really important and we will talk about in some future slides but this is just an illustration about how it does impact on the precision look now when you look at 93 percent you say oh this is too much but in principle this corresponds to only misclassification here only one okay but of course the overall accuracy is 99 percent so it means that uh, this model is pretty much fine okay now, if we try to do the evaluation, for example, on the other notebook, which is a trainable equal to false, we can do that. And we can see what are the misclassifications. Okay, now it's, it is evaluating again the dev data. So this is now when we have set the trainable equal to false. So in the beginning, it takes a little bit of time to evaluate. Okay, so here 94% and 93% on the test data set. But what is important to look at is here. Okay, so of course here it will give you the precision and the recall for uh, all the things. And here you can see the confusion matrix. Uh, so we have 93% of uh, accuracy. And we can see, for example, for uh, we have 13 uh, correct prediction of uh, the car and this is why the recall is equal to one so it means that our model is able to perfectly recall what is a car uh, also we have 12 correct prediction for the car sedan and this is why the recall is equal to one here and we have uh, for the SUV uh, it has 100% precision and 90 89% uh, of recall so why is that because here if you can see for on uh, nine predictions it made one error okay it has confused the suv uh, to a sedan and this has affected the performance so 98 here is because it's basically eight divided by nine if you make eight but uh, eight divided by nine it's uh, 89 percent okay although it's only one misclassification and this is why maybe uh, one of the strategies here is if we try to increase the whole data set so that we have more data in the test data set this will enable to to draw better uh, better uh, precision and recall values okay here for uh, out of 11 prediction for uh, so out of the prediction for the bicycle it has confused the bicycle to a to a bus so this is a big mistake and here it has confused the bicycle to a motorbike uh, maybe this is less critical but here it means that there is really something wrong because the, uh, there is a big difference between the bicycle and the bus so here when we analyze we have to look at this problem okay why it has confused the bicycle as a bus maybe i didn't train trained for a longer time for a long time okay i need to train longer or i need to change the network or I need to, to do some hyperparameter mm -hmm. tuning maybe maybe doctor there is bias for the color for example all of the bike are specific color and this same color for the bus yes well, basically what we do usually uh, we we try to print all the misclassification now if you look at the end of the notebook uh, i made a method that will give you all the misclassifications and this will allow you to understand the misclassified object like for example this one uh, we will see this one is predicted uh, motorcycle shopper and it is motorcycle racing 
okay this can be acceptable and this one sedan is confused to SUV uh, yeah okay uh, this one is bicycle with bicycle Doctor, the third yes. one is a label mistake right which one the third one here because it's predicted it as uh, yeah. the third one yeah look the at this one. yeah this yeah. one is this one is critical like this is a motorcycle bicycle and it's confused with a bus okay this is a bit weird right it's not acceptable. this one doctor in the middle the left Wait. one now the, yes the uh, bike it says it's a uh, bicycle kids which is true that's what it's predicted i think this is the label mistake right yeah here uh the yes. predicted is bicycle kid and bicycle racing yeah no the bicycle kid is something like this look yeah this could be but it's confusing this one is confusing i mean maybe this one is not very important uh, or this one is not very important yeah this one could be a mountain bike yeah in any case yeah, you, in any case you can't have a perfect model you can't have like something always 100 percent but so this kind of misclassification i would say they they are fine uh, I, I will not worry too much about them but this misclassification i will worry about it yes. because there is a big difference between a bus and the motorcycle okay it's only one but we don't know whether it will generalize if we have more instances into the test so same thing here i i can analyze this one it's motorcycle with motorcycle bike okay okay sedan with suv it looks like an suv here and sedan with suv okay so basically here we can identify that this could be more critical than than all other misclassifications and we can do the same uh, here here we have only one misclassification okay on the test on the test that I said okay so is it clear for this evaluation matrix Yes. Okay. I think so. Very yeah. So you know, now you know how to use them. Okay. Of course, now if you use tensor flow, this is automatically calculated. But you can also calculate it manually if you want to check, like we have done now. Okay. So in general, when when you build machine learning model, try to fix one evaluation metric. Okay, you should not be scattered. Okay, I want to satisfy all the evaluation metrics. No. So basically, people use like the F1 score. Some some people are more interested into the accuracy itself. So the first observation, of course, that we do is about the accuracy. But later on, you can calculate your F1 score to check. Now, for example, if we look back at the F1 scores here, we can have a better understanding about the performance. Okay, this is a training equal to false, and we can compare the F1 score of this one with this one. Okay, to, to see the difference. Okay, look at the F1 scores here. It's one, one, only here. Difference, but here the F1 score is, is actually different for, it is only 100% for the motorbike sport. It means that it did not confuse it at all. But here for all for the other classes, there is at least one confusion uh, between uh, any two classes. Okay, so the F1 score basically it combines both the precision and the recall. Now instead of just comparing precision alone, recall alone, just compare the F1 scores, which is a combination of both, as you have already introduced. Okay, so another thing that uh, you also have to take into account when uh, you develop deep learning project is uh, the execution time versus the accuracy. Now imagine that you have three classifiers, uh, classifier A, classifier B, and classifier C, and A gives you 90% of accuracy, and the execution time is uh, 80 milliseconds, whereas the classi classifier B gives you 92% of accuracy, and the running time is 95 milliseconds. And the classifier C gives you 95 of accuracy, but it spends one second and a half 
for the inference. So in this case, which one is going, are you going to use? I'd say the middle one, that we have to have like some equation up to the side. Yeah, same thing, because if uh, I use the right take... objective... I think it depends on what the problem, Victor. Yeah, basically here it, it will yeah, depend on... Yeah, if it's a safety yes. critical uh, issue, we'll yeah. have to take the most accurate, even if that means sacrificing time. Yeah, yeah now, exactly. Yeah, so now if you need actually very uh, real-time performance, so in this case maybe you can sacrifice some uh, accuracy on depends on the real-time inference performance. Especially now, for example, if you are predicting on video frames and you, you want to process, for example, 20 frames per second or 30 frames per second, and you cannot do this uh, with uh, 1.5 seconds per frame. So if you spend 1.5 seconds per frame, uh, per, uh, per frame, yes, you cannot process. Uh, uh, it will be even lower than one frame per second, which is very low. So if you want to do the inference on only one frame and uh, not in real time, for example, offline, you just send an image and you will make the inference on the cloud like uh, whenever you have time. So that will be fine to choose the highest accuracy algorithm. But if you want to have uh, real time performance now, it depends on how many frames per second you want to achieve. OK, so if you use, for example, 80 MS, OK, uh, we can make some uh, calculations uh, with 80 MS, uh, one divided by 0. Uh, 0 0.08 so this will give you like 12 frames per second okay but this will give you only 90 percent of accuracy and if you use 95 percent uh, okay 95 ms so we can divide uh, 1 divided by 0 0.095 this will give you only 10.5 frame per second and of course the classifier c will not even give you one frame per second so here it depends on uh, what you want to achieve as a real-time performance. For example, now in the lab, we have developed a face recognition application. Uh, we have two, two types of face recognition application. One of them is for attendance. So in the attendance, you send an image, uh, you will make an inference on only one image, and then you will uh, send back the name of the person that is recognized. Okay, so we can tolerate, for example, one second or two seconds or three seconds in order to get the result. So in this case, of course, you would like to use the highest accuracy possible. And for the runtime, we, we don't care too much because we can tolerate uh, like a few, few seconds for uh, the response to come. Now, if you want to do the same thing on face recognition, but in this case, apply to a surveillance application. So what does it mean a surveillance application? It means that you have a video stream coming and you have to check in every frame, all the faces and identify them. And then uh, for every face that is identified, you will send it to the cloud. You say, I have identified this person at this time. Okay, in this case, you will sacrifice a little bit of accuracy because you want to process, for example, 20 frames per second to be able uh, to, uh, to conduct the recognition algorithm in real time. Okay, and of course, there are some techniques in, in deep learning that will allow you to optimize deep learning model uh, to make them uh, to run uh, much faster. For example, if you develop a model with a TensorFlow, uh, you can do uh, tensor RT optimization if you are going to run it on any NVIDIA GPU, including jets and boards. You can also uh, make some, uh, uh, some more optimization for uh, smartphones uh, with IRM architecture using TF Lite. So there are some techniques that will allow you to optimize the model, the same model, to have, uh, to have uh, higher execution time. But this sometimes will be on depend on lower accuracy. So I can give you, for example, some of the techniques that is used in Tensor RT is that we reduce the uh, float point precision. Now, for example, in TensorFlow, we use 64-bit uh, 64 float precision for, uh, for doubles, I mean, for the weights and everything. We can make, for example, we can reduce the float precision from 64 bits to 32 bits or even 16 bits. And some of the optimiza optimization techniques, they reduce to eight bits only, so it becomes integer instead of uh, of a float. Of course, in the extreme case of uh, you change the floating point accuracy to integer, uh, you will have much higher accuracy, but uh, you will have much higher uh, real-time performance, but you lose a lot in, in accuracy. Because, for example, everything like uh, uh, 1.2 will be just becoming 1. So you, you will lose these precisions 
uh, that is uh, of the floating point completely but with uh, with uh, with 64 bit you will get the highest precision and you can reduce a little bit the precision by just having 32 bits or 16 bits so there are different levels of optimization of the floating point accuracy this is one of the techniques that is used uh, in addition to pruning some layers of the deep learning model uh, and this all of this in order to uh, improve the real-time performance of the inference models is it clear yes Doctor? Yes. Uh, so, go ahead, Paul, go ahead. Uh, so, yes. in summary, the, sometimes a more accurate model is more complex, so, so the prediction takes more time. Yes. Okay. Yes. When you said we can change some hyperparameter uh, that affect the data. Like, for example, if we increase complexity and the number of layers and the nodes, this will increase one time? No, here we are talking about the inference. When you say hyperparameters, this is something related to the training performance. Okay, now we are talking, you have a model, okay, and you want to check the training performance. Now, let me make an example. Which hyperparameter, which hyperparameter that uh, we use it in, uh, after, with model? No, now the model, look, the model is like a black box. Now, this is a model, look. You have here a checkpoint. This is a model that you built from the training. Now, you will use this model for prediction. And we can calculate the prediction time. Look now. If, if for example, I take an image and I can make model that predict. Okay, so this, just to predict one image, it takes this amount of time on a GPU. Okay. If you okay. if you do the following, so w what matters here is how much time it is taking to predict one image. Now, if for example, if I change the GPU here, uh, change the runtime type. GPU. Okay. I hope that it will not. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, no, it has reset the session. Connecting. I hope it will not reset the session. You need to re redo all of. Yeah, I have to redo everything. Yeah, okay. But this consider as, for example, the hyperparameter, GPU and CPU, or what? No, no, it's not a hyperparameter. This is like... Uh, I mean, hyperparameter for testing, Dr. Yanis. No, no, this is the hardware. The, it's not a hyperparameter. Hyperparameter is something related to the model, not related to the hardware. Uh, there is no relation. Uh, no, no hyperparameter for testing. No, no, no. No. Okay. Now, for example, if I change the... If I change the, from GPU to CPU, of course, we're going to spend a lot of time here, uh, but let's see how much time it's going to take. Okay, for data visualization, it's not a big deal, but for the prediction... Maybe it takes a long time with prediction only, but for example... Yeah. Oh, it's this quicker. Yeah, it's, qu it's quick, but it's still uh, maybe four times slower than the GPU. Okay, but okay. it will not affect accuracy, right? Accuracy that with model. No, no, the, yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do with accuracy. I mean, it will have the same thing, look. It will not change anything. Okay. Yeah, it will not change anything here. Okay, so we can see here the prediction per uh, the time needed for prediction. What is predict? Yes. We can also check here, for example, uh, t0 equal date time dot date time dot now. And we will do the same for print. Okay. Minus t0. Maybe because here we have you have only one image, you don't feel too much uh, the difference. But now, if for example you make the prediction of uh, 20 frames per second, it will matter a lot. I mean, if you have just for example uh, double of uh, the time, you will have half of the number of frames per second that you can process. Okay, so the video, the inference for example on video is different than if you make inference only on one image. And in machine learning project, actually, the inference time is something that we care too much about. It. Okay, yesterday I was in discussion of uh, 
like a project with a company and one of the requirements was that they want to execute this in real time so for example if you say i will develop you a model it will give you like a, a 99 percent of accuracy but uh, i can just only process uh, one frame per second uh, they won't be happy about this because in the use case deployment they want to monitor things in real time so you need to consider this uh, when you design your, your model of course in the beginning you might be only focusing on trying to find the best accuracy possible but later on when you go for production and for the deployment so you will find yourself that the execution time will play much more importance than any other thing voila okay let's make a small break now uh, 